Good morning. My name is Bruce Siegel, and I have been working with the Senior Law Day Collaborative uh, for several years now, and I'm excited to be here today with my colleagues. Uh, just a, a couple words uh, on the outset about the Senior Law Day programs. We offer educational programs to seniors and their families in Westchester County. Uh, since the um, March 2020, we've been entirely online with webinars uh, every other week, uh, which you can uh, stream, obviously, which you can view here. You can get on our email list, but I'm also going to show you our website um, and our webinars are all recorded. Um, our next one, we're going to take a break for the rest of August and our next one is coming up uh, on September 1st. But then I did want to also point out that on August 12th, you can have a private Zoom consultation with one of our attorneys or another professional. So just come back here on August 11th um, and you can sign up for a time. You can also at any time ask a, a question through this Ask Us button. So I'm just going to stop sharing. Hopefully you can see everyone again. And I wanted to introduce our speakers who are going to be speaking about uh, making healthcare decisions for another person. Very challenging and interesting topic. I'm looking forward to what they have to say. Um, and we have Gretchen Flint, who's a professor emeritus, emeritus sorry, at uh, Pace Law School, as well as Roberta Goodman, who's a senior staff attorney at the Pace Women's Justice Center. Uh, just to um, a couple of housekeeping things before I turn it over to them. Um, you can send, if you're having trouble with the volume or something of that nature, you can send me uh, a chat message. Uh, if you have questions for the presenters, uh, just go to the Q&A button here. You should be able to see on your screen at the bottom, and we'd be happy to entertain your questions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Gretchen and Roberta. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. We're so glad to be here. And the focus today is on the substitute decision maker uh, who in New York, and we're going to focus on New York, although if you're for, from somewhere else, a lot of the advice that we have will be um, useful for you too. But New York has some kind of, you know, a little bit idiosyncratic laws. And so we're going to focus on a little bit on what the law is, but more on kind of the practical and ethical issues that arise when someone is called upon to make healthcare decisions for someone who doesn't have the ability to make those decisions themselves. We've had other, uh, we had another web webinar last year where we talked about when you want to um, appoint someone to make decisions for you, and in senior law days over the years, we've always had a seminar about that. I'm sure we'll do it again. But today the focus really is on when you're called upon to make a decision for someone else, how do you do that? What, what are you allowed to do? Um, how do you make sure that you're doing the right thing by the person who's asked you to make decisions for you because you're the healthcare proxy? or because the law gives you the authority to make a decision for someone else. Um, these are difficult decisions, right? It's always hard. Uh, we don't want to suggest that it's easy, that we're going to make it easy. It's always going to be hard. Uh, however, if you're prepared and have thought about it ahead of time and have got gather the information that you need to make the decision, it should be easier than if you're called upon in an emergency to make a decision and you're not prepared to do it. So we're going to start with just talking very briefly about who has the authority to make decisions for someone else uh, when that person has lost the ability to make the decisions themselves. And just to maybe state the obvious that every person has the right to make medical decisions for themselves as long as they can understand what the decision is, what the consequences of the various choices are, and can articulate that choice. So we're 
only talking about people who cannot do that, cannot engage with their doctors in a way that they're making what we call an informed choice. So um, there are three, um, there are really three situations where um, the law gives someone else the authority to make the decisions for someone else. Roberta, what are those? You are a healthcare agent pursuant to a advanced directive that has been properly signed and witnessed by an individual who had capacity at that time and is over the age of 18 years and has designated an individual and perhaps as well an alternate to make decisions for them in the event that they do not have the capacity at that time to make the decision. The second uh, person or individuals who are authorized to make medical decisions for someone who lacks the capacity to do so is a guardian. And that is a court appointed guardian and that's pursuant to the mental hygiene law, article 81 or the New Circuit's Court Procedure Act, Article 17A. And the third instance in which someone has the legal authority to make a medical decision for another person is if that individual who does not have the capacity is currently in a hospital, a nursing home facility, a hospice facility, and pursuant to the Family Health Care Decision Act, which was enacted in 2010, there's an order of priority in which someone is given permission, legal permission to make those medical decisions. And the order of priority begins with a court appointed um, surrogate. It then goes to the spouse. It then goes to, or a domestic partner. And um, the domestic partner, you don't have to have a Formalized, but there is an intent that you are domestic partners, an adult child, a parent of the individual, a sibling of the individual, or someone who is a close friend. So what, what's the difference between what the authority that someone who's a healthcare agent has and someone who's making a decision uh, because there's no healthcare agent or no guardian um, under the Family Health Care Decisions Act? Well, when someone is a, um, an agent appointed pursuant to a, um, a health care advanced directive, there first has to be a determination by a physician that the individual whose um, treatment is being questioned has no capacity. And that determination of lack of capacity is done either at the time that the treatment is contemplated or if someone has a, um, a terminal condition and they are having an examination, a consultation with their physician, they, the physician can prepare what's known as a MULST form, a medically ordered life-sustaining treatment or a non-hospital DNR. And that document um, is a document that contains the wishes of the individual and provides guidance and instruction to the healthcare agent to articulate what treatments they would want or not want. And as we all know, um, each situation is different and you can always anticipate what the situation is going to be and what the contemplated treatment is and so consequently, there's a series of questions that need to be asked and we can dive into that a little bit later. Um, when someone is in a facility and they do not have an advanced health directive, and so they're trying to trigger the Family Health Care Decision Act, the, um, the individual, um, if, the, if the individual already has on made known their wishes, perhaps there's a living will on file, then the surrogate should be following what those wishes are. 
But if the surrogate is having to decide on treatment that includes um, withdrawal or uh, withholding of life-sustaining treatments, they need to go through an exercise of, of conversations with the healthcare providers to determine, you know, would this be, would this treatment result in a, an extraordinary burden to the patient? Um, what if the patient is in an incurable condition? Would there be pain associated with the treatment or would there be pain that would result if the treatment were not provided? So there, all of these um, agents, whether it's designated in a document or triggered because of where someone is, requires conversations between the healthcare provider and um, the person who is going to be making those decisions. Right, and so that's certainly important. And what we know, and this, these, um, there are times when a surrogate is going to be asked to make a decision, even though it's, um, even when it's not an end of life decision. Sometimes people don't have the ability, either permanently or uh, temporarily, to make a decision, and somebody, right, needs to make the decision. So you may know, if you're the healthcare agent, we hope that you've had the conversation with that person about what kinds of treatment they would want, especially if they're suffering from a chronic condition and they are, have educated themselves about their disease and they've had those conversations both with their doctor and have had those conversations with you. We hope that that's happened, but often it hasn't, either because something has occurred that was not anticipated, right? You might have had the conversation about what kind of cancer treatment the person would have wanted, and then they have a stroke and actually never thought to have that conversation. So you may know what the person wanted, or you may not. Um, if you know, you still need to talk to the doctor, right? You still need to find out what's the purpose of the treatment? What are the goals of the care, both specifically and generally? Um, is this treatment, as Roberta said, is it going to cure? Is it going to make the person more comfortable? Is it going to um, involve pain? How can that pain be mitigated? Most people, right, in my experience, want um, as far as possible not to have pain. Sometimes we're willing to um, endure pain because of what the outcome is going to be. But again, you can't make that decision without knowing and without hearing from the doctor what the best um, assessment is of what the results of the treatment are going to be. Again, you may know with some specificity what the person would have wanted in this situation, or you may have to um, make a some educated guesses. Um, there may also be other people who have had that conversation with the patient, even though they're not the person who has to make the decision. So think about who else might have had those conversations and then uh, try to integrate that information um, into your assessment about whether the proposed treatment is a good idea or not. Uh, again, we start out with, is this something that the person would have wanted if they could make the decision themselves? Um, and that's, we call that known wishes, right? Um, but again, many times we don't know exactly what the person would have wanted. Um, and then we get to the standard that's called substituted judgment. Mm -hmm. And the way we think of that is you put yourself in the shoes of that person, not knowing specifically what they would have wanted, but how they would have decided if they got all of the information that you've been getting. Um, so you might be able to draw a conclusion based on what you do know about what they wanted, but also about how they live their life. 
right? What they might have talked to you about their views about quality of life. Uh, what you know about how, what was important to them or what you can find out from other people about what was important to them and what their idea was about how they wanted to live, um, you know, into their old age. You know, that situation, um, sometimes the patient may have been in the, those shoes themselves and have had to make the difficult determination of um, whether to agree to propose treatment or not. And so their life experience, which they may share with you, could shed some light and insight into whether or not they would, if they were you know, in that position at that time, would want the treatment or not. And I think we, we can't um, emphasize enough that we want to know whether the treatment, I mean, we need to be informed, that's the goal. And we want to know whether the treatment is going to cure the underlying condition, is going to provide pain relief without impacting um, the length of the person's life. And what's the expected outcome of having the treatment or not having the treatment? You know, for example, for someone who has difficulty with eating, um, if an option is to perhaps have a peg tube, which is inserted into the, um, the stomach and is not, you know, I've never had one, so I can't speak personally, but they say it's not as uncomfortable as having a nasogastric tube, which to me would be very invasive. And these are just my personal views. But if the peg is something that is going to provide nutrition and get the individual past a certain point where they're then able to become comfortable again and perhaps might be able to resume eating again, you know, this is an, a very important conversation to have with the medical team. What will this procedure do for my family member or my friend? So, yeah. Gretchen, we do have a question. Um, which is how do you determine lack of capacity uh, to trigger healthcare agent making decisions? Okay, well, so that's something that the doctors do and um, the law requires generally two doctors to make the determination that the person doesn't have the ability to make the, the usually the particular decision. Uh, for someone who has been appointed a guardian, the judge will have decided uh, based on the evidence in the proceeding that the person doesn't have the ability to make healthcare decisions. And so that decision is pretty much final unless there's a modification of the order. But for people for whom there is no guardian, the, there are gonna be two doctors who are gonna make an assessment and make a determination that the person doesn't have the ability to make the decision. Now, I wanna say, uh, one thing um, about that, um, that the person needs to be, is going to be informed that the doctor has made the decision that, or the determination that the patient can no longer make medical decisions or can't not make the particular medical decision. And if that person objects, if the patient objects and says, no, I, I think I should be able to make the decision, then the agent or the surrogate doesn't have the legal authority to make any to make any decision. And if the doctors disagree with what the patient wants to do, uh, the hospital or the doctor has to go to court. So um, the patient always has the opportunity to object as long as right as long as they're conscious. Obviously, someone who's unconscious or in a coma, right, is not in a position to object but they have the right to be informed and to object if they don't want either the healthcare agent that they appointed or the, um, or the surrogate under the law to make that decision. So let's talk a little bit about best interests because that's the last um, sort of standard that a surrogate or a healthcare agent might um, might use for making a decision. 
And sometimes the surrogate or the healthcare agent or the guardian, right, can't find out enough about the person to feel like they can actually stand in their shoes. You know, some people are, you know, have lived very isolated or private lives, have never had the discussion with anybody, right? And it's just not possible to even stand in the shoes of the person for whom you're making a decision. So then the law allows the surrogate or the healthcare agent to make a decision based on best interests. And what what is that? Roberta, how would you define best interests? Well, best interests obviously um, involves a personal decision. Um, what, how is it that your patient presents? Is your patient someone who was healthy up until the moment that the treatment is being requested? Were they able to otherwise walk into the hospital or walk into the room? Were they able to engage with others in a meaningful conversation? Were they bedridden? Were they um, cognitively impaired where the diagnosis of the impairment was such that it was going to escalate and there would be some point where they would not be aware to our knowledge of their surroundings and participate in any meaningful way. So best interest is really a very personal determination. And you know, maybe they have very strong religious beliefs. And if you are not going to do a treatment that they um, would, that their religious belief requires it to be done, that would not be in their best interest, regardless of what the treatment might provide or not provide. Right, and, and again, um, what, we, what we need to be careful about when we're called upon to make the decision for someone else, especially when it's based on best interest, that we don't impose our own views of what um, is, what we would want on someone who we don't really know. It's more of an objective standard. Um, and so if we don't know what the person would want, if we can't figure it out, then we're looking at what? Some of the same questions. Is this treatment going to involve pain? Is this treatment going to involve a cure? Is, um, is the treatment um, going to uh, prolong the dying process? Um, is it going and, to be meaningful, really? Is the treatment right. going to be meaningful? Right, is it going to take the person back to whatever baseline they were before? Um, and what, what did that life look like before? And not whether we would want that life, right? But whether um, objectively the treatment is going to um, not make things worse, is the way I would put it. Um, and what we would hope is we'll return the person back to some kind of quality of life. There was an article um, from an ethics um, professor who posed the following questions. Was the patient likely to get better? Did the patient have pleasures in life that would outweigh the burdens of treatment? Could min minimal medical intervention give the patient more time to enjoy those pleasures in his her, or their life? So those are really basic questions that need to be addressed um, in order to help decide what the treatment, um, whether to accept it or not. And when we were preparing for this presentation, we talked about time and that time is a resource. When there's an emergency situation, you don't have the time. But if it's not an emergency, time is 
your, your tool. Time will allow you to give thoughtful consideration to these questions and to then seek more information if you are not getting the answers that you need in order to make a reasoned decision on behalf of the person that you've been asked to make a decision for. And there's no harm in agreeing to a treatment on a trial basis or on a, for a short-term basis until you can gather the information or have the conversations that you need to have. Um, while it might feel different psychologically to withdraw treatment as opposed to not starting it, as a matter of law, there is no difference. So for example, you might want to agree to tube feeding for a short period of time because being fed through the nose is not comfortable and you might see that the person you know, needs to be restrained so they don't pull out the tube. On the other hand, you might want to get some time to really make a thoughtful decision about whether or not to allow tube feeding on an ongoing basis. And the way you get that time is to agree for a short period of time um, to see, um, to allow you the time to, um, to make a thoughtful decision. The, the other thing that we should talk about a little bit is emergencies, right? So because the authority of the surrogate doesn't start until there's been a determination of incapacity. Uh, if there's been no determination, that is, there's no guardian appointed, um, if emergency services are called, they are required to evaluate and treat. And it doesn't matter if you have a healthcare proxy or if you're the surrogate because there needs to be an assessment of capacity before the agent has the authority to, um, to act. Now, for situations where you or the patient has decided that they don't want to go to the hospital, um, that they want to die at home, right? the way to avoid the problem is to get what's called a non-hospital DNR order. Um, and also to try to get the patient enrolled in hospice. And then the hospice will have a protocol for when the patient is in some kind of distress. And that involves treating the person for pain and so on at home and not calling 911. Uh, again, with the opportunity to plan, you also have the opportunity to make sure that the treatment that is provided is consistent with the decisions that the patient would have wanted or the decisions that you or the surrogate have made in the patient's um, best interest. So you don't wanna be caught off guard. You don't wanna be unprepared, especially if you feel the decision would have been not to uh, engage in um, CPR, not to, um, sometimes people don't, you know, decide not to go to back to the hospital because they would rather be at home. But you can't really, you can't make that happen without planning and without making sure that um, someone who's required by law, right, which is the emergency workers, aren't on the scene and they are gonna say, no, we, we're required to transport this person to the hospital. We're required to try to start their heart even though you know, and you might really know that's not what they wanted. To Gretchen's point, it, um, one, one thing that you should try to do if the opportunity presents itself or if you are able to make the opportunity to uh, become available is to ask the person who has asked you to make their medical decisions if they lose capacity to do so, may I accompany you to one of your doctor appointments? May I sit in to be part of the conversation so that I can learn and your healthcare provider can become familiar with me um, so I can understand 
what your diagnosis is, what the prognosis of that diagnosis is, what are your treatment options, what are the consequences, either the benefits or disadvantages of going forward with one of the treatments, what happens if there's an adverse consequence to one of the treatments and then you're no longer able to communicate whether you want to continue or not to continue. So asking for permission to participate in one of the visits or more if you're granted that um, access is an excellent way to learn what your person would want whether it's in an emergency situation or um, something that is because of a deteriorating condition, they need to do some other type of treatment that was not previously contemplated. I do, I do have a, a, a question that's just come in, which is that this all sounds great to do all this planning, but when you get into a hospital, the doctors and the nurses just seem like so busy. So how can I kind of deal with the pressure, especially if I'm you know, an agent and not even you know, for myself? Well, two things. Well, more than two. The first is the law actually requires the agent to engage with the treatment providers. So one thing you can say is, yes, I have the authority to make this decision, but I'm not allowed to make this decision until you talk to me about the goals of treatment, about the, the um, consequences of treatment, about the risks, about the benefits. And um, so that's one thing to understand that your authority comes from the law and the law provi provides certain obligations both to the agent and also to the doctor. So the doctors also have an obligation to deal with the surrogates and the proxies in the same way that they have an obligation to deal with patients who have capacity. So yes, they're busy, and we've all had the experience, even for ourselves sometimes, that we don't feel like we're getting all of the information that we need. But this is the time when you put on your advocate's hat, when you say, I'm not signing unless I feel secure in the knowledge that this is the best thing to do. And you do have that, you have the power to say no on behalf of the patient. And you need to, you need to remember to wear that advocate's hat if you feel like you're not getting the right information. You can always ask to speak with the um, supervising physician or nursing staff in the hospital setting. And if you're turned away, just keep going up the ladder until someone responds to you. Right. If, if, the, if, the, treating, um, if the treatment team wants to think something is a good idea, they are going to deal with you if you keep saying no right? If you say, I'm going to say no until I get the information, they're going to have to deal with it if they think it's a good idea. And they are required and doctors are required, you know, by their code of ethics to um, communicate with the patient and those responsibilities get transferred to the agent or the surrogate or the guardian. If the physician finds themselves in a position where they disagree then with the surrogate, you could then, and the physician may then very well bounce it to the hospital's ethics committee. And what that looks like is you have a room with different um, disciplines within the treating staff and you are present and you are presented with the patient's information and a, a very thoughtful discussion is then entertained to determine what the next step is. So 
there are lots of ways that there can be conflict around a decision about what to do or what not to do. And the first thing is the law really, you know, assumes that everyone is acting um, with the patient's best interest in mind. And so, however, if someone thinks that's not what's happening, they have the opportunity to challenge any decision. And ultimately that requires going to court. Now, nobody wants that, right? Um, nobody wants to have a judge decide what kind of treatment someone's going to get. You know, the judge isn't going to know the person. Um, the judge is not going to be in a position to make a thoughtful and I might add timely decision, right? The, the law books are filled with cases where a decision was made after the person died, right? And that's not helpful. So when there is conflict, you wanna figure out how to manage that conflict, how to try to get everybody on the same page. So there may be conflict with other members of the family, right? The law requires one decision maker. Why do you think that is? Because, you know, the hospitals, the doctors don't want to deal with the whole family, but we know how families work, right? We know that most of the time we want more people involved in the decision and not few. So who might help you present the information to the other family members? There may be a social worker, there may be a chaplain, there may be, again, maybe the doctor, right, was willing to have a family meeting um, and try to get everybody on the same page. If, again, if the patient is disagreeing, right, again, I would certainly try to make sure that the patient understands as much as possible about what's going on. But if the patient says, no, I don't want that, you know, I don't, I don't care, right? And the doctor is saying, but I don't think she really understands that she's gonna die if she doesn't have this treatment. Then, then it's gonna be up to a judge, quite frankly, if that can't be mediated. Um, sometimes uh, either the doctor or maybe the hospital or the nursing home will say that they have a religious or philosophical objection to the decision that's being made, usually to withdraw or withhold treatment. If that's the case, the, and it's the physician, the physician has the obligation under the law to transfer the care to another doctor who's willing to, uh, to follow um, the direction. So again, not that the person is saying, oh, I don't agree in this situation. If the person says, my religion tells me that I cannot participate in this decision, they don't get to impose their view on the patient. They are required to then transfer the patient to the care of another physician. Sometimes it's the facility. It might be the hospital, more likely it might be the nursing and the patient may have ended up in this nursing home not knowing that if there was a decision to withhold treatment or withdraw treatment that the nursing home would say, no, we don't do that. If that happens, you also have the right to transfer the patient to another facility that's willing to abide by the decision. And the nursing home must legally comply and assist in the transfer. So you don't wanna be in that position if you can help it, but if you find that you're in the decision, the patient has an absolute right to have their wishes as expressed either by themselves or the surrogate to um, be in a place where their decision is going to be honored and, um, and implemented. Um, so, if you're getting pushback about a particular decision, you want to find out, right? You want to try to, to explore, well, what is this about, right? Is it because the doctor thinks that 
this treatment will result in benefit to the patient? Or is it because the doctor has religious or philosophical views that are going to interfere with what is an appropriate decision for this patient under the circumstances? A few minutes ago, um, I think you partially addressed a question that just came in, but let me just ask it more, you know, sort of more head on, which is that can a family member override the non-family member's determination? Only by going to court. Yeah. I mean, it, well, let's put it this way. Let me, let me try to be more precise in my answer. If the, if the person making the decision is the guardian, right? The guardian has that right. But if somebody objects to the decision made by the guardian, they can go to court. But they're going to have to prove that the guardian is acting uh, inappropriately. Is it different when it's an agent versus a guardian? It's, it's kind of the same. So yeah. let's say someone appointed a family friend, right? This happens, not infrequently. You know, someone will say, no, I want my friend to make the decision because I know my children will never agree to withdraw treatment, even though that's what I want. And so the family friend is appointed the agent. And the time comes when there's a decision to make right? And the family friend makes the decision that the patient would have wanted and the kids unsurprisingly say, no, 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 no. We want everything done. They can't just say, oh no, we're the children. We get to make the decision because that's not true. They would have to go to court and they would have to prove that the agent was acting um, outside the realm of their authority. And the agent's you know, unfortunately, the agent's going to have to show either they know what the person wanted, right? They are standing in the shoes because they know, they, if not specifically, they know um, what decision the patient would have made or ultimately best interest. Um, you know, part of the planning, right? when people are appointing agents, if, they, if their reason they're appointing their best friend is the agent because they know their kids are going to fuss, right? That's the time when they wanna make sure their agent can testify if necessary about the conversations about what the patient would have wanted when you know something in writing would be really great. Um, Again, if there's an agent, if there's a surrogate who's, you know, higher, higher up on the list and is willing to make the decision and people object, right? If it can't be worked out, and that's always would be my goal, is let's see if we can get on the same page about this. Then the person who's objecting is gonna have to go to court. And it's gonna be a pretty high burden to prove that the, that the decision maker is is not acting in good faith. You know, if an individual anticipates that their family members would disagree with what they would want, and so that's one of the reasons why they selected their best friend to be the person who is going to speak for them when they lose the capacity. Some of the things that the principal, we'll call them the, the, the patient, can do in advance is to write out a, a document, my wishes. And there are multiple websites, some of which we have identified as resources um, that will be posted by Bruce um, in the chat and can also be sent to people that provide tools for the individual to declare their wishes, to talk about what life means to them, what is meaningful to them. And that could be something that could either be shared in advance or it could be shared at the moment that a decision needs to be made and it's an uncomfortable decision because the determination of going one way as opposed to another might hasten an individual's death. Um, 
And, and that's one way because let's realize that the person that we are asking to make the decisions for us, it's, a, it's somewhat of a burden, although they are going to be speaking the wishes of the patient and not their own wishes, but they need to be able to advocate and to be sometimes a little forceful in saying, I know he or she would not want to live like this. And so consequently, I know that they would want to be as comfortable as possible. So I would request that there be palliative care and comfort care and not any invasive or aggressive treatment, which would not make the quality of their life any better. So you might have noticed, right, that there's a gap, right, in if there's no healthcare agent, um, that there's actually no one authorized to make decisions for a patient who's not in the hospital, not in a nursing home, or not in hospice. Um, if someone is at home and um, can't make decisions for themselves, you're going to have to rely on kind of the informal, um, the informal ways of making decisions. For a, a non-hospital DNR, um, please, um, sorry, just looked up at the chat. <laughs> um, for a non-hospital DNR, um, surrogates um, can make those decisions, right? The, the, the do not, has, do not, um, Resuscitate or intubate. ...are a little bit different than other kinds of decisions. Right. Again, if you know what the person wants, you can play that advocacy role. Um, and, you know, I don't think I'm going on too much of a limb here that if you know the providers, um, if, you, uh, if you've been involved in the patient's care, if you, in fact, are, are something of a caretaker or you're supervising the care, you'll be able to work things out. But let's learn from this experience and make sure that each of us has appointed the person that we would want to make the decision by using a health care agent. Um, the health care agent is going to have more authority. The health care agent um, is the person who's been chosen and who has really had the opportunity to learn about the patient's wishes and to make the, the best decision, you know, in the circumstances that we're not going to be able to always anticipate. Um, sometimes people assume that just because you're family, you're going to be able to make decisions. And legally in New York, that's not exact, that's not true. It's only true, right, in the hospital, in a nursing home where somebody is in hospice. Um, but if you know the person's wishes, right, even outside of an institution, you know, somebody's gonna pay attention to you. If nobody's fighting about what to do, right, it's gonna be easier if everybody's on board, right? Um, if nobody's fighting, decisions are going to be made that are in the best interest of the patient. If people are fighting, that's when people end up in court. And again, nobody wants to do that. I think another point that we can emphasize is that once you become informed and you learn what the goals of the treatment are and what are the benefits or the consequences, you can say, let's try it for a while, for a limited period of time. And you have the legal authority to say, okay, we've given it a few days and there's been no change. What, what can we anticipate? Or is the person who I'm making decisions for now experiencing some pain? And if that is the case, I would like the treatment to be stopped. And again, that authority has to be recognized. So it can be nuanced. It's not a black and white situation ever. You know, there are lots of gray areas and that's why conversation is the most important and knowledge is the most important. To talk with the person who has appointed you 
and to be permitted to be participating in um, healthcare provider visits. And if you're not able to visit, perhaps you can ask your um, person for a HIPAA release. And then that would give you permission to call the healthcare provider and to independently learn what occurred during the visit and what is, what is the prognosis and what are the recommended um, options for the individual. Because while the healthcare proxy contains a HIPAA release, we've learned that the healthcare proxy isn't triggered until the person has been determined to lose capacity. And so the only way that you can, that a healthcare provider can legally provide you with confidential medical information is through a, HIPAA, a standalone HIPAA release. And, and actually there's another thing that you might think about for someone who may not be able to understand the intricacies of the care that's being provided they still might have the capacity to appoint a healthcare agent because the capacity that's required to appoint a healthcare agent is different, right? So understanding whether open heart surgery is a good idea or not, right? For someone who's old and sick, right? And what the risks are and what the benefits are, that might really be beyond someone who's not always, um, uh, you know, doesn't understand complicated things. But that same person might really be able to understand and agree, right, I don't understand this, but I really want my daughter, my friend, my husband to make that decision and can choose the, they understand that what they're doing is they're allowing someone else to make the decision for them. And that's what signing a healthcare proxy is. So it may be not too late, right, to have um, a person sign a healthcare proxy, even if they don't have the capacity. The doctor is saying, well, this person really doesn't understand what the risks and the benefits of, you know, this very complicated procedure are. And so it gives the person the ability to decide who's gonna make the decision for them. And, you know, I would, I would always, you know, leave that possibility open. Of course, you want that to happen way before, you know, someone's facing open heart surgery, right? That would, that would be better. But if that hasn't happened, um, there still may be an opportunity to have the person decide who's gonna make the decision for them. And then that person, you know, can, First of all, keep making decisions in the community and also um, you have the authority that, uh, that a healthcare agent has um, to make um, really almost any decision that the person could have made themselves. I wanna just pivot for a moment and turn to the role of the, the physician, the provider. And so the American Medical Association has codes of ethics, medical ethics. And physicians are supposed to abide by these ethical um, rules. And one of the paramount rules is that they need to respect the autonomy and have allegiance to the patient so that a patient who lacks decision-making capacity, how do you fulfill your role? Well, you do it through third-party decision-making through the use of advanced directives. And, and what should the physician do? This, as Gretchen pointed out when we first started the presentation this morning, the physician is obligated to assess the patient's decision-making capacity in the current clinical circumstances to ascertain whether there is an advanced directive, and if so, does it reflect the, his her, or their current values? And that is achieved through a conversation with the person who has been designated as the agent. And then determine whether the current clinical circumstances meet the thresholds that are set out in the directive. So the only way they're gonna be able to do that is to you know, familiarize themselves with the patient's condition, familiarize themselves with the patient's wishes, 
based on the conversations or the information that they may have because they already know the person or if this is someone who's admitted to the hospital and you know all they have is just the emergency medical um, responders notes of bringing in the patient they have to spend the time if it's particularly if it's not an emergency to learn from the surrogate what are the what are the wishes and how can those wishes be achieved and if a conflict arises then time needs to be spent to resolve that conflict. So the physician is um, has to look at the surrogate as the paramount person to communicate and and make the you know based on guidance that's provided by the physician or the healthcare provider to to make the determination of to treat or not to treat or if to treat what treatment and for how long. Okay, we're almost out of time. Are there any other questions that you would like us to try to answer? No, just uh, drop them into the Q and A. We'll wait one more moment for that. Okay. And the resources are listed in the chat. Um, can people print the chat, Bruce? Um, they would have to download that Word document somehow to their drive or whatever, and then print from there. Okay. If there's any issues, they can just, I, I think one person would like me to email it to them. Um, so and, and it'll be on the Senior Law Day website, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so Cheryl, I, I think you just sent me a message. Either I can email it to you or just check on the website by Friday, and um, we'll make sure to have it. So... So it looks like other than getting a hold of the resources, um, it looks like there aren't any more questions. So with that, I just wanted to uh, thank Roberta and Gretchen. I mean, I learned a lot. This is just a fascinating, interesting topic. It definitely helps, I can see, to plan ahead. So I just wanted to um, thank you for your time. And then what I'm gonna do now is just um, uh, share the, link to seniorlawday.info one more time and thank our um, our sponsors. And then I'm going to put up a poll um, <clears throat> just to give you, so you can give us some feedback on whether this was helpful today. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for the feedback and I hope uh, everyone has a, uh, a great day. And um, check in next week for our consultations, as I said, next Wednesday you can sign up for a private 15 minutes.